I'm Ben Wattenberg. The Islamic population of the world is over one billion people and growing. Through the centuries, Islamic and Western cultures have often been at odds, even though their teachings share many of the same basic tenets. Joining us to discuss the role of Islam in the modern world are Fuad Ajami, Professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University, Milton Bjorst, Senior Scholar at the Middle East Institute and author of Sand Castles, The Arabs in Search of the Modern World, and John Esposito, Professor of Religion and International Affairs at Georgetown University and author of The Islamic Threat, Myth or Reality. The topic before this house, Islam and the West, is there a clash of cultures? This week on Think Tank. The West has long seen Islam as a rival culture. A thousand years of conflict from the Crusades to the recent Gulf War and terrorism in New York and Paris have bolstered this view. But is the clash perception or reality? Islam is the world's second largest religion, second only to Christianity. Islam continues to expand especially in Africa. Devotion is often intense, from daily prayer to the pilgrimages to Mecca, the holiest city in Islam. Today, many Islamic countries are developing modern economies, but most have not adopted Western-style democratic institutions. All the countries of the world that are not free are in the Eastern Hemisphere, except for Cuba. The countries that are not free, as defined by the human rights organization Freedom House, are shown in red on the map. The next map shows in green the distribution of Muslim majority countries in the world. Clearly, most of the not free countries are Islamic. Some analysts see in Islam a culture that is permanently opposed to democracy and to the West. Others argue that there is no such thing as a single Islamic culture. They say that Islamic societies can and will go their own ways without posing any threat to the West. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Fuad, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, a few years ago, Samuel Huntington wrote a uh, very controversial article in Foreign Affairs called The Clash of Civilizations. Maybe you could just lay out his thesis, and then I know you have a problem with it, and then why don't you tell us what your problem with it, and let's talk about that for a moment. I'll, I'll try to do a Huntington. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, are, you are now Huntington. Exactly, right. I, am, okay. I am now Sam Huntington. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, I wrote, uh, you may recall, I wrote a response in Foreign yes, Affairs I know to that. Sam Huntington uh, entitled The Summoning. Uh, Sam, in effect, uh, made the argument uh, that in the aftermath of, of the Cold War, and this is really a caricature of his, ar of his argument, that we will not have um, a clash of ideologies, that we will have a clash of civilizations, and that we will, uh, if you will, from almost the, the sort of the... Um, the wreckage of the Cold War, uh, we, will, we will resurrect these old civilizations. It will be Islamic, uh, Confucian, uh, African civilization. Uh, he, uh, Sam identified Latin America as a civilization, uh, and then, of course, the West, and that these will be the fault lines uh, in the world. These will be the fault lines uh, that, that matter. Uh, myself, I took an exception and, to And it. he said if there was going to be a war in it the will future, be a war it would be a war of civilizations it will be rather of, than of countries. Yes, it will be a war of civilization and uh, my, my response to Huntington and my sense at the time was, uh, it was it was almost interesting that Huntington, who has been one of the most brilliant students of the state, uh, decided to dispose uh, of nation states. Uh, I thought that uh, modernity for me is universal. Modernity is, uh, is universal. Uh, and that the clash will still be the clash uh, of states, that we still live in a world of nation states. And the idea that, that civilizations are blocks that you can t take a look at the, at the whole length and breadth of the Muslim world, all the way from Morocco to Indonesia, and subsume it under one category was, uh, was false. That the thing that really moves the world is the logic of interest. States are stubborn beings. They're, they're monsters. I mean, they're very unsentimental. And the world economy is what really matters. I mean, if we really want to talk about something, when we say that you know, s several societies in the Muslim world uh, are in trouble, they are in trouble because they cannot compete in a modern world economy. Okay, now are, are you all uh, Huntingtonians or Ajamiites? 
Well, I <laughs> am. I, I think there is a clash of civilizations in the sense that there, but this is not new. I, I mean, the Christian Western civilization has been in conflict with Muslim uh, Eastern civilization now for 1,400 years. Um, it's likely to continue, whether this means war or occasional terrorism or whatever um, is a different story. Uh, I think that um, um, Sam Huntington made a wonderful rhetorical leap here into something quite perhaps useful to debate, but I think um, even if one accepts certain premises, and I do, when and what he's saying. When you sit down and deal the cards, you, you don't yeah, deal yeah, it's with the is, is, Islamic civilization. You deal with a variety of nations. Well, you deal with a variety of nations, and you deal also with uh, something that has been both a constant and, a, and something in flux throughout all of modern history. Um, my view is that the West defeated Islam, if you want to say that, sometime during the era of the Ottomans uh, three or four hundred years ago. Um, I don't think that Islamic civilization is likely to be a threat to the West at any time in the foreseeable future. It is trying to catch up with itself, um, and if occasionally it dumps on the West, denounces the West, gets angry with the West, uh, I can understand that. But it's certainly not going to be a threat it, it, to the West. If you view Islam as a civilization <laughs> rather than as a series of discrete nations, it becomes much more threatening, doesn't it? No, I think I think part of the the problem is that we still tend to deal with these sort of broad categories. You know, we, we talk about Islam, and it's as if there's some sort of monolithic civilization out there. I think also where I think what what Huntington's article also reveals is that his generation missing the point in terms of the role of religion in international affairs. And so what's happened is in recent years we see not just in the Islamic world but globally. <coughs> Uh, a, a, a resurgence of religion in, in, poli in politics, whether it's in Sri Lanka or it's in India, wherever. Okay? And I think or that in the United States. And, and in the U.S. And I think right. that what you see in the Huntington piece is suddenly having gone through what I call the politics of underestimation and overreaction with regard to the role of religion and ethnicity and forgetting that, as, as Fuad said, mm -hmm. that it's often interest and national interest that become the, the key variables. I mean, when you look at the relationship of the Muslim world, let's say, uh, to, to America, and you look at Muslim countries, there, there are countries that, that have had a hostile relationship with the U.S., Libya and Iran, and there are other countries uh, like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan that have had good relations. And a good deal of that is not so much based on civilizational as national uh, interest. But, but, but aren't uh, American interests everywhere throughout the Islamic world uh, threatened by Islamic fundamentalism. I mean, Saudi Arabia fears Islamic fundamentalism, hmm. uh, Egypt fears it, uh, Morocco fears it, Algeria fears it. I mean, I, I guess the argument is within Islam is this tendency toward fundamentalist Islam, which too often expresses itself in some sort of terror, or at least such is the perception. Is that a powerful movement within Islam? Is it? Uh, a movement that could take over additional states and would it then threaten us? I mean, I guess I that's the argument. I think you have to break out the term, though. I See, I think part of the problem is we use this term fundamentalism for uh, a whole group of Islamic political and social activist organizations. And I think that, th again, these organizations like nations are diverse. There are indeed extremist groups out there who, in the name of Islam, threaten their, their governments and their people much more than they do when you think about it the West. But you also have a whole set of Islamically oriented political and social organizations or Muslims in Muslim societies who in fact participate socially and politically and if allowed to do that would continue to, 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 uh, to uh, participate in society. I think if we don't make those kinds of distinctions, just as we have to distinguish among nation states, we have to distinguish among Islamic activists, whatever we want to call them, then I think we do feed mm -hmm. a clash of civilizations approach. We've got a monolithic threat. See, a generation after the Iranian Revolution, you see, we were traumatized by the Iranian Revolution when the, when the armed imam came by jumbo jet from, uh, from Paris. Uh, to the Bearing audio cassettes. Uh, right, exactly. Right, right, right. Uh, when he, when he returned. Riding on audio cassettes. Um, Excuse me? Riding on audio right, cassettes. Right, that was right. the fuel that right, was right. in that jet. So when, uh, when he returned that, home, we, we uh, thought, uh, surely the, uh, we were ready uh, for, uh, for, if you will, that we saw the Muslim world as a row of dominoes. It was a new domino theory. They will all uh, fall. Uh, myself, uh, you know, I had a kind of uh, uh, a skeptical view of this. 
uh, that the Iranian revolution would be almost a revolution in one country. It wouldn't duplicate itself. Uh, and much as we talk about the imminent overthrow of these Muslim governments and the, and the defeat of, of the secular model, uh, the facts really don't bear this out. Uh, the, the Egyptian state is not going to be overthrown. Uh, we, we always write its obituary, but it has been around a long time, and it really is in the saddle. Uh, the Saudi state is not really going to be overthrown. Uh, there's no likelihood that the, the fundamentalists or who, uh, the people who call themselves fundamentalists in Saudi Arabia will overthrow uh, the Saudi state. There is no likelihood that they will win in Jordan. And even in a place like the West Bank in Gaza, there is no likelihood that they will prevail against Yasser Arafat. Uh, the but powers... The, 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 Hamas the Hamas group is, is going down. The Hamas, the Hamas people, uh, they will, they will mm. thrive. Uh, they will thrive only if there is poverty and despair to, uh, to, to feed off. Uh, when Khomeini returned to power, the great, the great man, uh, at the time he said, look, uh, someone came to him and asked him about economics. And Khomeini said, my revolution uh, is about Islam. It's not about the price of melons. It is about the price of melons everywhere, worldwide. What, what and the same is true in the Muslim world. Has there been in the Islamic world anywhere a successful functioning democracy? I mean, if that is one of the <coughs> uh, criteria by which one says mod modernity has arrived. But the, di the difficulty, I think, with, in asking that question and posing it is if you look at, at the majority of the Muslim world, you're talking about, uh, until roughly World War II, you're talking about two centuries of European colonial rule in so much of the area, which did not encourage these institutions. Then you're talking about the rise of modern nation states, most of which emerged artificially, most of which wound up with, with governments that were, were run by kings, military and ex-military. And therefore, you have not had a period of history in which you could wind up with the <coughs> political sort of culture and institutions being allowed to develop, which, which enable this transformation <coughs> to democracy. Is there anything in the Islamic culture or the Islamic religion that would stand in the way of a developing democracy? See, I, on the question of democracy, I mean, I, I take a slightly sort of conservative uh, orientation myself. Uh, I, I believe really George Kennan is right when he says, you know, we talk about the incidence of democracy in, uh, in the world. Uh, democracy is but the habit. Democracy is but, are but the ways of, uh, of that peninsula of Asia that he described as Europe. Uh, it's really like if you take a look at, if you take a look at, the, at the world as a whole, I mean, I know people think that the stocks of democracy are up. Is Russia capable of a, of a successful transition uh, to democracy? I have my doubts. Uh, are, the, uh, are the people, the Ukraines, uh, capable of a transition uh, to democracy? Well, I have really, my doubts. I mean, the, the argument has been, from an American point of view, that democracies don't really go to war with each other. So yes. there's, a, there's a reason for us to be yes. other than how, our how great, about, great How about if we redefine this a little bit? Um, uh, and, and not in, a, in parliamentary terms, but merely to say participation. Um, is there something in Islamic civilization which stands in the way, not of democracy, because we, that's, mm. that's hopeless. Right. In terms of participation, can the freedom common... Freedom of expression. Yeah, well, freedom, but not just freedom of expression. Can we have government run for the people rather than for the sake of the, of the perpetuation of the state? And the fact is, there has been, I would go even further than what, you, what your question suggests, I'd go further to say that not only is there not the germs of democracy, but there really is not much, much hope even for, or much precedent even for participation. The state has been such a, a monster throughout all of, of, of the history of this region, and there has been so little ideology which would provide some popular basis for rebelling against this kind of state. So I'm, I'm not only feeling gloomy about the prospect for democracy, but well, even there, participatory government. Isn't it what one, one reads about it, uh, isn't there sort of a, a, uh, a tropism toward the modern way of life, toward American <laughs> television and American movies, and you hear sure. stories in, of Saudi Arabia that you know, you're, they're officially against drinking and against Western dress, but in the privacy of their villas, uh, there is a very different sort of a life going on and so on and so forth. I mean, I I is that bubbling? I think yeah. that as states open up, because I, I agree with what Milton said, I mean, the way the situation is now, there's a problem. But if states open up, then I think one can expect to, expect to see political participation develop. 
but, but this doesn't necessarily, the problems of the past, doesn't necessarily have to be equated simply with the nature of Islam because remember that <coughs> all religious traditions, I mean Judaism and Christianity, had to in a sense reinterpret themselves to, um, to make themselves compatible with modern democracy and even Sam Huntington two decades ago said that he saw uh, Judaism and Christianity mm. making the transition but he wasn't sure if one group could do it and that group was Roman Catholics and that, that's changed mm. but he was right when he made the observation you know, in the 20th century, you had a papal bull that in fact condemned what, is, what would be normally be seen as modernity, and it wasn't until Vatican II that pluralism was, accept, was accepted. And so, re, you know, traditions do reinterpret themselves. So what I'm saying is that on the one level, it's political and economic factors that are important, but then if we say, you know, can the religious you know, tradition uh, come along, I, I think that in fact traditions do reinterpret, and if one looks at what's going on in the Muslim world today, there are many uh, Muslim intellectuals mm. who are dealing with the question of political participation and trying to reinterpret cultural categories. Look, I, I think from an American point of view, I mean, <coughs> w w when people think of is it good or is it bad, mm. I, I, I think the phrase gangster state comes up there. Uh, with the exception of North Korea, the world's gangster right. states, so-called, right, are, are Libya, Iran, Iraq, right. I guess Syria, wh whatever, wh where you would have uh, the possibility, for example, of state-sponsored uh, uh, terrorism. I is that an accident that the great preponderance of these kind of states are in the Islamic world, in the Arab world, or, and is, is that a, a passing phase, or is that something that we have to really worry about? Look, there are, there are renegade states, and I think we should view them as renegade states. I mean, I, per mm. I, I know there are people who say we should, you know, uh, we should offer the Iranians an olive branch and so on. We should offer them nothing. Uh, you know, no one, we should see uh, the Iranian state, we should see the Iraqi state, uh, we should see the Syrian state, we should see the Libyan states uh, as, as renegade states and they should be treated uh, as, as, as such. Uh, I mean, I don't think we should, we should look for uh, other ways of, of saying, oh well, what is the connection between uh, these states and, and uh, the large uh, civilization and the large cultural container from which they come? Because I just don't think it's really about that. I mean, these are revisionist states. And uh, we were just talking about participation in, in, in states in, in the Muslim world. The fact of the matter is that there are, if you take a look narrowly at, at, at the Middle East, um, there are the dynastic states in, in the Gulf and the monarchical states, and they are a breed apart. And then there are these national security states, the Syrians, the Iraqis, and the like. Uh, and, and you're right. I mean, if you take a look at, the, um, at these national security states, they belong to a different world. Uh, they came out of the anti-colonial <laughs> world, they came out of a military container, and uh, unless, they are, unless they transform and reform the, the, uh, the life in, in these societies will remain to be the Hobbesian existence it continues to be. Your question, Ben, is, is the right one in the sense that because uh, Iraqis or Saudis or whoever like television, like occasional drinking, like to come to the United States or to Paris in order to, to enjoy themselves, doesn't that mean that somehow Western civilization or Western values, including democracy, are having some impact upon these cultures? I mean, you, you, you hear stories of, of when, uh, for example, when, when Dallas was, was right. running of the... Very popular. Uh, 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 very popular. Right. Of, of the mullahs coming into the... Uh, uh, into the mosques uh, the next morning and preaching their their text from what happened on the television. Well, last absolutely. Well, all, all that is all that is correct. And then the next question is: Is this having an impact in, in, intellectually, spiritually? And the fact is that Islam is a very powerful religion. It has a a huge impact. It has really. You see very few instances of conversions from Islam. You see very few instances of the retreat of Islam. Uh, whatever you, f you may feel in analyzing Islam and its, and its uh, compatibility with modern values, the fact is that Islam has served this civilization very well for a long time in preserving its identity, and it is doing that now. Thank I think Islam is a lot stronger than Dallas. Just on, on, on this line of, of culture, uh, some, uh, some years back, uh, not to invoke our host, uh, you know, uh, you did something, I instead of taking a look at, at what Huntington says about the clash of civilization, it was about America as a universal nation. The fact of the matter is the American model is ascendant in the world. Uh, now, it doesn't mean uh, that everything about it is going to be exported. Democracy doesn't travel so well. What travels about the American model 
Uh, a friend of mine, Ali Mazrui, once said uh, that people love the u that unique American combination, high technology and low culture. Pop culture <laughs> travels very well. And it's indeed uh -huh. kids with sneakers and t-shirts, kids with sneakers and t-shirts who took on uh, America and the American uh, example in Beirut and other places. The irony is in the Muslim world from 1973 onward when the Arabs, uh, the heartland, if you will, of this Islamic civilization became rich uh, and Iran uh, because, of the, uh, because of oil wealth, the irony is two things came in tandem, Americanization and anti-Americanism. The places bec became much more dipped into the American uh, orbit, if you will, uh, and they were being assaulted and seduced, and particularly the young are being seduced. Uh, Milton says that, uh, you know, that Islam is very powerful. It is powerful, uh, but modern culture is also uh, extremely powerful. And the temptations of modern culture, uh, this, this, this push uh, and, and, and pull of modern culture uh, is enormously powerful. And it's really this, this, mm. this cross currents in the world of Islam. Uh, from one side, your ancestor is summoning you back, if you will, to the past. From the other side, the world of the foreigner. And modernity is many things. It's many things. It's a messy thing, this, this, this creature called modernity. Yeah, I mean, For my, many people. My, my sense, the war between the ancestors and television is almost always won by television. Yes, I mean, that's that's For many well, people but in the see, Muslim I, world, I don't, it's I don't the cultural think, I don't think threat. That's right? let, let John go there. Okay, For many me. people in the Muslim world, uh, it's the cultural threat, much more than, if you will, the American or Western uh, a political threat that is seen as the most uh, insidious. Um, and this is what has engendered that, that fundamentalist uh, backlash. Daniel Pipes uh, and I were at a, a meeting recently and Dan talked about the fact that he quoted a quote Pakistani fundamentalist who denounced uh, Madonna and Michael Jackson as cultural terrorists, you know, visited on the country. Well, my comment on that was also that Dan had his source wrong. It was probably myself. So it's, <laughs> even though I'm a Western, I happen to see them as cultural terrorists. But the, but the point is they, they do represent a certain kind of cultural impact, we can call it low culture or whatever, but that has had an uh, incredible impact throughout the world, not just in the Muslim world. Yeah, but, but, but just, to, I mean, it, it, if the culture of our allegedly low pop culture, I'm not sure, so sure how low it is, but, but if, if that culture I is ascendant, uh, aren't the things that go with it, uh, individualism, uh, pluralism, uh, merit, upward mobility, all those sort of American ideas which culminate, I think, probably in political democracy. Aren't they traveling under I, I, cover I, I as, think as it's, uh, I, cultural I, I, imperialists? Yeah, but I think it's a little self-serving to think that they will. Let me put it in a slightly different framework. I think that what has always gone on in all religions, uh, and it's particularly gone on in Islam in recent decades, is a struggle for control. Um, Islam for 1400 years or whatever you like has been under the control of very, very, a very rigid clerical class who has defined the dogma. I mean, you can sit down and read the, uh, sit down and read the Quran as all of us around here have done and find in it all kinds of conflicting, different, open, closed, uh, horrible, wonderful messages. Take what you like. It's who's the guy who determines what the orthodoxy has been. And I think that Islam has been under the control of a very rigid group of people who have passed their, their lore on from generation to generation for more than a thousand years. I think that there is genuinely, genuinely a struggle now over who might grab Islam. It's going on in Egypt probably more than any place else because Egypt is always kind of the spearhead of intellectuality in the Islamic world, but it's also going on elsewhere. You can also see it in Saudi Arabia. You can also see it even in, Isra in Iran. There is an effort to take the momentum of, of the religion away from this narrowly based class. I'm not terribly optimistic that the modernists will win, but I think the struggle is going on. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Milton Viorst, Fuad Ajami, uh, and John Esposito, and thank you. Please send your comments to New River Media, 11507 17th Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. We can also be reached via email at thinktv at aol.com or on the World Wide Web at www.thinktank.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg.
This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.